your brain is. <laughs> be the glory. In the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, the writer talks about hope and how this hope, this hope that we have is set before us and how encouraging it can be to us that we, we take hold of this hope that's set before us. In Hebrews 6.19, it says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. 
Well, it was the grace of God that put that hope in front of us in the first place. One of the things Pastor Joe is going to talk about today is how during conversations, we can extend that hope to other people. Will be forever. 
pray with me. Father God, a lot has been happening down here this week. 
things that are not surprising to you. Lord, I come to you humbly this morning asking for your guidance and your wisdom for your people. Lord, there are many who welcome this decision that was passed this week, and there are those who are scared. There are those who are confused and even angry about this decision. And Lord, I am thankful to know that each life is a gift from you, a gift that you have ordained, that you have knitted together from the start, a gift of life worth celebrating. And I praise you that we know that, Lord Jesus. Lord, I also know that because we live in a fallen world, a baby does not always feel like a gift. There are women who are upset today, who are not sure how things will ever work out, and I pray for these women, Lord, the women who have felt this in the past, the women who are feeling it today, the women who may feel it in the future, and I pray, Jesus, that they would know the truth of your gospel, the truth of your love, the truth that we can have hope in you, and that even when things seem uncertain, you've got this. I pray that for those of us who know your truth about life, I pray that we would be a support system. I pray that the church would rise up to help women in need, that we would open our homes and our resources to women who may find themselves in situations that lead them to think that a baby is anything but a gift. Lord, give us wisdom in how to share your truth and the hope that comes from following you. God, I pray that we would meet people with your compassion and your selfless love that you so greatly displayed on the cross for us. I pray that you would help us all have that same compassion and selfless love on those around us, even when we disagree. Lord, let this victory be an opportunity for believers to act justly, to love mercifully, and to walk humbly with you. God, you are so good, and we thank you for the gift of life. We also, Lord, thank you for the offering that we're about to take this morning. We pray, Lord, for your continued guidance and how to use it to glorify your name and share your good news. Lord, thank you for these things, and in your name, amen. You may be seated. Good morning, everyone. Hope you all are having a fantastic Sunday. It is great to be with you this morning. If you're new here this morning and, and I miss you or one of our greeters missed you on the way in, uh, we would love to connect with you after the service. I'll be back at the doors with a connect card for you and a gift. And so we would just love to get to know you a little bit better. Uh, and we're glad that you're here this morning. And hello to those of you who are watching at home. We're glad that you're joining us as well. Uh, we have lots of volunteer opportunities coming up. We wanted to share those with you this morning. Uh, Jedi Training Camp is starting tomorrow. We're super excited about that. But then Faith Lab is coming in the next few, week, in few weeks, and that's our VBS opportunity. So if you love those little kids in preschool through fifth grade, the sticky ones, the loud ones, this is the opportunity for you. Uh, we hope that you would be willing to give up some of your time that week to come out and help. Lisa needs lots of hands to help unstickify all the little hands. Um, and VBS will be on July 11th through the 15th from 8.15 to 11.30 a.m. And so if you're interested in helping with that, we encourage you to sign up online. If you haven't got your kids or grandkids signed up for VBS, we encourage you to do that. Uh, Lisa is so creative in the ways that she connects with kids, and I'm excited to see how she connects science and the Bible and just helping kids know Jesus better. So it will be a really fun week, and we hope that you join us for that. So again, volunteers needed for that, and I want to say thank you for all those who signed up to volunteer in various ways for Jedi Training Camp. Super excited to be wielding lightsabers here tomorrow and to just get to know Jesus better through a fun movie that kids really enjoy. So thank you uh, for those of you who volunteered and who helped keep ministry happening here. Now, the high schoolers convinced me last year to go out into the woods for a weekend of camping. I was reluctant to go, and somehow they managed to convince me again. Uh, so high schoolers, we will be going camping at, at the end of July on the 22nd through the 24th. We're going to go to Kickapoo State Park, and we're going to do tubing. We're going to connect and just get away from our regular routines, and we're going to worship the Lord together. And I'm super excited for this theme. We're going to do Christmas in July for the weekend. There will be real trees for us to decorate in the woods. I'm so excited. I don't know if there's electricity out there, but I'm going to find out. 
Uh, <laughs> thanks, thanks for laughing. That was cool. Um, camp is $40, and that will cover the cost of, of tubing, of food, of a t-shirt, and all the Christmas magic that we can muster up for that weekend. So if you're interested, please sign up online. We'd love to have you there. Lastly, I come up here every week, and I share all these announcements, all these things that are happening, and it can be hard to keep track of all the things. So if you uh, are not aware, we have six different ways that we communicate everything that's happening here at FBC. And so I just want to draw your attention to a few of those. Maybe some of them you know about, maybe some of them you don't. And if you'd like to connect and get on a, an email list or whatever, uh, we would love to help you do that. So we have an email list, a newsletter that goes out each week. So if you're not on that list, we would love to put you on it. And that has all the happenings coming up at FBC. And that's sent out each week. Uh, we also do social media, so we have the Instagram for you younger folk, and we have the Facebook for some of us older in between folk, um, and the email, you know, for everybody. <laughs> but social media is a great way to connect and find out what's going on. Lisa updates that every day. She puts out something that we want you guys to be aware of, so definitely check that out and follow us there if you're not already. You will also notice that throughout the building there are TVs with scrolling announcements, so if you're walking through the halls, and we hope that you see those announcements, and it's also running in the hospitality room. So while you're getting your coffee and your fifth donut, you can watch the <laughs> announcements and get a taste of what I'll be sharing anyway. So you, you could already be ready to go um, before you even get here. And then lastly, we've just recently started doing this. We've printed out the newsletter, and we're putting it in Sunday school classrooms. So if you're in a Sunday school class, uh, they should have printed packets out of the newsletter. And if your teacher does not have that, uh, let us know, because maybe we missed a classroom. So we can uh, make sure that you all are aware of those things. So these are just a few of the ways that we communicate. Uh, if you need to help uh, getting in contact with one of these um, resources, let us know, and we will we'll get you what you need. And then last thing. There were serving cards handed out to you this week. We've handed those out in the past. We've updated them of some different ways that you can serve, some ways that maybe you weren't aware of. If you are looking to get involved here at FBC, this is a great resource to check out and see where you can serve. A few things mentioned on there are VBS, like we already talked about, greeting, hospitality room, media and tech team, security team. These are all great places that we need people's help. And so if you are willing to give up a portion of your time, uh, we would love to, to work with you with that. Thank you so much for being here, and look forward to hearing what Pastor Joe has to say this morning. Good morning, church. Good morning, good morning. And welcome those joining us online as well. Uh, I got to tell you, this, the message this morning is kind of convicting to me. Because my mind goes back to several years ago, hasn't been recently, whenever something happened. And I, I'm talking to my wife, and my wife Brenda, she's doing dishes in the kitchen. And, and I look at her, I'm like, what is up with our kids? I know no, no other parent has ever had that conversation. I'm like, what is up with our kids? And my wife just nice as can be, just looked at me and said, have you looked in the mirror lately? <laughs> like a bunch of mini me's, just louder, <laughs> right? And, and our, our conversations, how we listen, how we speak, what we do, they're so very important because especially our children, our grandchildren, they're like little mini me's. They, they really do mimic what we say. They mimic our words. They mimic our actions, our values, everything. But they do it louder, <laughs> don't they? I don't know how many times I have to say, lower your voice, quiet. They, they just do it louder, they exaggerate it. And it was in that moment that I realized my wife was right. One of the many, I get to be right like once a month. But it was in that moment that, that I realized I needed to change as a parent, that I needed to change. Because I was seeing the outcome, and yeah, there are louder versions, but I don't know about you, but when I look in the mirror, there's some things I know needs to change. And that's about the time when God smacked me in the face with this verse in James. James 1.19. He has smacked me upside the head with this verse. My dear brothers and sisters, 
take note of this. Everyone, I think that word everyone, self-explanatory, right? Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. We have a whole bunch of little mini-me's all around us, mimicking what we say, what we do. This morning I'm not going to talk much about the angry thing, slow to become angry, because we all know that we shouldn't be quick angry and quick tempered. And, and I, I can tell you that if you're good at the first two, being quick to listen and slow to speak, slow to become angry is just natural. And we, we know that we shouldn't be quick tempered. The proverb 14 verse 29 says this, a person who does not quickly get angry shows that he has understanding. But a person who quickly loses his temper shows his foolishness. We know that. As parents, as adults, even some of the younger people in the room, we know that when we get angry, we, we start saying things we don't mean, that we're sorry for, and we do things. So this morning, we're, we're going to look at how can we be quick to listen? How to be slow to speak, what that looks like, what God's word tells us about uh, being those things, quick to listen, slow to speak. And really, th there are many, many passages. There's at least 25 different proverbs that talk about how we should listen, how we should speak. And uh, this morning, I'm, I'm going to dump several on us, but I want to share three keys on how we should listen, how we should speak. James tells us everyone should be quick to listen. So how do we listen? How should we listen? Well, the first key in listening, being quick to listen, is we should listen with love. We should listen with love. The first thing God says about being a listener, the th first thing he wants us to know is how to listen with love. Now, you're, you're probably thinking, how do you communicate that in a conversation? How can you listen with love, Joe? That seems kind of weird. Well, let me ask you. Have you ever been with somebody, a boy or a girl, that you were in love with? <laughs> you just knew they were the one. And you were looking at them. You were listening to every word they said. You were hanging on them. You were intensely focused at what they were sharing. That's listening with love. Now, it might be a little exaggerated there, but listening with love is, is focused, intense, seeking to understand, right? Right? Because we all know there's a difference between hearing and listening, right? There's a difference between hearing and listening. Hearing is when everybody's talking in the background and I'm watching a, a football game and then all of a sudden everybody gets quiet. I just heard the silence and I hit mute and I turned to look at my wife. <laughs> I was hearing, but I wasn't listening. <laughs> there's a difference between hearing and listening. And if we're quick to listen, we're listening with love. We're intensely focused on the conversation. Our communication will never get better if we don't actually listen. Sit with someone. Understand what they're saying to us. I, I, I love Mark chapter 10, verse 21. Jesus models this. Jesus models this so perfectly. And, and we can miss these things in Scripture. We can go by them so quick. Over in Mark chapter 10, verse 21. There, there's a rich young man, a professional. He's wanting to follow Jesus, and he comes up to Jesus, and, and he has this question, like, 
Why, why do I need to follow you? How can I follow you? And look at what verse 21 says. Jesus felt genuine love for the man as he looked straight at him. You see that phrase, looked at him? Jesus was looking at him. He was focusing on him. He was understanding him. That word present comes to mind. He looked. He loved. See, great communication is, is when you sit down face to face with someone. And when we talk about being quick to listen, really, folks, this, this can't happen through a text message or social media or an email. This needs to be face to face. It needs to be face to face. That's why Matthew 18, 19 is so important. If there's an issue with someone, you go to them. You seek to hear their side of the story. Listen to them. And as he looked at this man, he knew what he needed. And you, you might know the rest of the story. Jesus cared for the man. Jesus wanted the man to follow him. He said, you need to go sell everything you own. Give it to the poor and follow me. Jesus wanted the best for this man. He looked, he listened intently with love. Proverbs 20, verse 12, says it like this. God has given us eyes to see and ears to listen with. I just want you to notice, do you see anything about a mouth up there? You see anything about a mouth? I find it so fascinating that the creator of the universe gives us two eyes and two ears and one of these. We know communication. There's a whole lot of stuff happening in nonverbal communication, right? Because just, just like I talked about, you're listening with love. You're... <laughs> Have you ever seen somebody that wasn't listening in love? Maybe they were upset. Is there a difference? Oh yeah. I don't know, the moms in the room, they have that look. You know that look. From across the room, you get the head turn. Right? That, that's all you need, you don't need to say anything. If we are quick to listen, we're listening with love. God gave us two eyes and two ears Twice as many of them as a mouth. We probably need to listen twice as much as we speak, right? And that's a key to listening in love. We're intensely focused on what they're saying. We are listening. We're present. We're with them. That's being quick to listen. A second key to being quick to listen is this. We're listening patiently. And I know that should go without saying, but it's important to say it, okay? Okay? If we are quick to listen, we are listening patiently. We are being patient. We are keeping this closed while we are watching, we are looking, and we are listening, right? We are listening patiently. We're listening before we speak. And a lot of times, we're going to have conversations with, with a child who's had a bad day. We, our kid comes home, and maybe somebody said something to them, and they were bullied. Maybe they're struggling at school and the teacher said something and it hurt. Maybe it's the other side. Maybe our kid comes because they're scared that they may get caught. They texted something to someone they should not have. Or maybe they were the ones that bullied. We need to be patient and listen. Before we speak, we need to sit and understand where they are. We need to let them share what they're feeling. We need to get their perspective. Can we do that if we cut them off <laughs> and don't get the rest of the story? No, we can't. We can't. And see, one of the things I know about myself 
And this is not a good trait. And I, I know many men, there are some women too, we struggle with that, with this trait. We like to fix things. So when someone comes to us and they start telling us something that we know how to fix, it's like that spring that's coiled up inside that just wants to pop out of our mouth, right? We just want to tell them how to fix it. That's not being quick to listen, is it? It's not. We need to wait to get the whole story. Proverbs 18, 13 says this, anyone who answers quickly without listening first is both foolish and insulting. I want you to think about that proverb for a moment. And I know this is something we've all struggled with or are struggling with in our conversation and communication. This is a normal thing, being patient while we're listening. But think about it for a moment. If you have one of your kids coming actually wanting to talk to you, and if they're a teenager, you know that's rare, right? You hope you have that relationship. If you cut them off, you start assuming and presuming you know what all of the issues are, and then you start telling them how to fix it before you really know. Is that kind of insulting to them? Is that listening with love? Is, is that showing care and compassion? Do you think they're going to come back to you next time when there is a critical conversation that they want to have? We have to be careful. We have to listen patiently to our kids. Not, not just our kids. I give this advice in premarital counseling, to marriage counseling, to, to people. I have to remember this myself. All good communication begins with listening and understanding and hearing people. Understanding their feelings, what they're dealing with, what they're struggling with. And, and here's some advice. And I'm, I'm just going to throw guys under the bus because it's typical, but it's not always the case. When you come home and, and you see your wife or your children, and they come up to you and they start doing this, 100 miles an hour, listen with love and keep this shut. There, there may be stuff in the midst of that that, that we could probably fix, Sometimes it starts out with, with that exciting thing that happened at school, somebody's shoes and somebody's socks, and then it moves on to the soccer game or the baseball game or the practice coming up or that concert, and, and it comes all the way back around. It's amazing this journey that happens in conversation. And there's a half a dozen things that they're seeking your advice on. And as you are listening, they finally run out of steam. And they just look at you and go, oh, thank you so much, that helped. I didn't give you any advice. But that's the point. They know you're listening with love. They know you care. They know you are listening patiently understanding what they were feeling, what they were going through. That's being quick to listen. That's being quick to listen. I, I think uh, about Jesus. He shows this over and over again in so many places. And we, we've talked about what happened when Jesus um, got a message that Lazarus was about to die because he was deathly ill. And then Jesus waited and Lazarus was dead and, and Jesus comes and when Jesus would go to Bethany he would often stay with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus who were his friends. And Jesus already knew the solution before he showed up. He already knew that he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He didn't want to just simply heal Lazarus of his sickness. He was going to put on this miracle on display, 
proving that he was Christ. That he is Messiah. There's never been anyone raise someone from the dead who had been in the grave multiple days. No one. He's proving he's Christ. And as Jesus goes into Mary and Martha's home, this is what it says in John 11, 32 through 36. Mary fell at Jesus' feet and she cried out, Lord, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. In other words, she's saying, I know that you could have healed him, but he's dead. If you had been here, he would have lived, and now he's dead. And it says, now when Jesus saw Mary, saw her, weeping along with many others who were weeping, he was deeply moved. And you, you might highlight that or underline that in your Bible. He was deeply moved. Jesus was sharing their feelings. He already knew the solution, folks. He already knew Lazarus was going to be back with them soon. Yet he listened patiently enough that he sat there in their sorrow, their sadness. And he heard. He cared. He had compassion. He says, where have you buried the body? Come and see, Lord, they replied. Now the next two words there in verse 35, it's the shortest verse in all the Bible, it says, Jesus wept. Say those two words. Jesus wept. You just memorized the scripture verse today. Good job. <laughs> but do you understand Jesus already knew the outcome. And he listened patiently. He shared their feelings. He had empathy for what they were struggling with and going through. He didn't just cut them off and say, rub a little dirt on it. Get back in there. Suck it up. It'll be all right. Sticks and stones may break your bones, but words will never harm you. I may have used that one a dozen times or more. No, Jesus sits, soaks in their feelings, and he weeps with them. Friends, we have a God who cares deeply about our pain and our problems, even though he knows the solution. And he sits patiently with us. He listens to us, listening with love, listening patiently, caring deeply, being quick to listen. That's what it means, listening with love, listening patiently. And another key to being quick to listen is listening without judging. And this is really difficult for us. It, it is. It's difficult for so many of us. To listen without judging. Being slow or being quick to listen means we, we don't make those snap judgments. We don't assume we have a clear picture. We don't presume we know the whole story. And here's the problem. Your kids, your husband, your wife, anybody who starts talking to you about something and you start feeling emotion, you start listening to them and you start feeling it bubble up inside of you. It's really easy to start getting upset at them or at other people, isn't it? It's almost like a volcano that needs to explode and erupt. We need to be careful not to do that. We need to listen until we get all of the facts. Keeping an open mind, not prejudging. Maybe, maybe a good word to use is we should listen without being triggered. Right? Even if we disagree with whatever it is, we, we don't have to be disagreeable. We should listen without judging. Making that snap judgment. Proverbs 18, uh, 13 
and 15, it says this. I like how it says it. What a shame. Yes, how stupid to decide before knowing the facts. A person with understanding gets the facts, and a, the wise person listens to learn more. It, listening proves wisdom, proves understanding. And if you want to prove your foolishness, just cut right in there and, and just get triggered. Just get upset. Just start picking sides and assuming you know the rest of the story. Because you know that word, assume. When you assume, it makes a rear end out of you and me both, right? I mean, it does. And we've all been there. We've all made those snap judgments. And it's wrong and it's foolish. It's just foolish. And, and there again, Jesus is the perfect person that draws people's thoughts and feelings and understands, gets all the sides of the story before speaking. Uh, I, I think of that proverb 20 verse 5. It says people's thoughts are like water in a deep well, but someone with insight can draw them out. If you are quick to listen, you are letting them speak and you are helping draw out what is inside. To get the rest of the story. Jesus was so good at this. I think of the time when a woman was caught in adultery. She was caught in sin. And, and she, she was grabbed by religious leaders in Jerusalem and taken to Jesus. Now the leaders, the Pharisees, they were trying to trap Jesus. At the same time, get this woman killed. Jesus... In only a way that he can. Draws out the heart of the issue. Not only does he actively list, listen to the Pharisees, he listens to the woman as well. You see, if you know the story there in John 8, the Pharisees come basically saying we need to kill this woman we need to stone her because she was she was caught in adultery and Jesus is like well if you haven't sinned then you're worthy to throw the first stone has anyone of you sinned and strangely enough by Jesus understanding the entire situation what the Pharisees were trying to do, drawing out what was really happening. We come to verse 9, and we see the rest of the story. Jesus was left there alone with the woman. And then he, he listens to her. She's standing before him, and Jesus stood up again and he asked her, Woman, all those people have gone. Does no one judge you guilty? She answered, No one has judged me, sir. And Jesus said, So I don't judge you. You may go now, but don't sin again. You know how hard it is to hold our tongues when our kids do something wrong? to not make a snap judgment, to listen with love, to listen patiently. I've asked, him for, asked forgiveness for this many times. See, we all come to Jesus the same way, knowing that we're sinners in need of a Savior. And if we want our kids to come to us with critical conversations, we should not judge them. We should listen. Do we sweep the sin under the rug? Absolutely not. Jesus says, go and sin no more. That sin is extremely obvious. You see, being quick to listen means we're listening in love. We're listening patiently. And we're listening without judgment. Without judgment. And it's hard. It's hard to be quick to listen, isn't it? As parents, it truly is. Just as just as adults, it's hard to be quick to listen. And I, we've kind of sat on this 
part of James being quick to listen more than more than being slow to speak. But it's so very important because we need to sit and soak with people. We need to listen to them. We need to understand what kind of impact listening itself has. How very healing it is to be present with them. To be able to give them the type of of conversation and care and concern that they need. And so how are we slow to speak? What is that like? How are we supposed to speak? Because we're not supposed to speak until we've listened, right? So I want to run through this fairly quick. And I've, I've really just captured it in three words to make it a little easier. Three keys when we think about when we speak, what it should look like, the type of words we should say, things like that. The first one is this, location. If we're slow to speak, we are mindful of the location. And by that I mean we are mindful of the time and the place. We're talking about critical conversations here. We need to be very intentional about when and where we have these. Ecclesiastes 3.7. Ecclesiastes is written by the same guy who wrote Proverbs. Solomon, who just happens to be, the scripture says, the most wise person ever lived. He said it like this, there's a time to be silent and there's a time to speak. In other words, there are times you need to speak up and there are other times when you need to shut up, right? And wisdom is knowing the difference, isn't it? You need to ask yourself a question when you are listening, is this the right time? Is this the right place? Ecclesiastes, a handful of chapters later, uh, chapter 8, verse 6, Solomon says there's a right time and a right way for everything. He's just really reaffirming the the time, the place, the location. We need to be very careful and intentional about these conversations we're having with people. And maybe the question is, how do you know when you've missed the right timing? I mean, how do you know if if you're if you you're in the wrong location or the wrong time to have the conversation? Usually a key indication is when there's an argument. That's usually an indication when there's hostility, when there's anger. Proverbs 12 or 17, 27 says it like this. Those who are sure of themselves do not talk all the time. People who stay calm have real insight. See, when before we speak, we need to make sure it's the right time and right place. We need to stay calm. And it's really hard. Maybe our kids have messed up, somebody we know is messed up, and they're coming to us. Maybe they've even hurt us as a result. It's hard to stay calm in those moments. And, and listen to me. I, I can think of a great example of this, of the location, the time and place. How many times have you been on the way to church Sunday morning and got in an argument with your kids, your spouse? Somebody started yelling or raising their voice. Is on the way to church good time to have a critical conversation? I guess that only happens in my family. Sorry. No. Do you know who wants you to do that? Satan. He wants you distracted for the entire worship service. He wants you to act like you're singing the words and praise to God, but really in your heart, you're still mad. Is that worship at all? See, location is important. Being slow to speak means you're mindful the right time, the right place. Second key is preparation. 
If you're mindful of the location, the time, and place, it means you're prepared with what to speak and when to speak it, how to say it. Speak with proper preparation. This means that before you open your mouth, you're praying about it. You're praying for the right words. You're planning what to say. You're seeking God's wisdom. You see, Jesus did this himself. Over in John chapter 12, verse 49, Jesus says this, I have not spoken on my own power. Instead, the Father who sent me told what I should say and how I should say it. I find this fascinating. Christ, Christ himself prepared what he would say before he said it. And oftentimes in scripture, we know we, he, he would go away to a quiet place to pray. See, we need to prepare. We need to pray. We need to think about what we're going to say before we say it. I mean, Proverbs 16, 23, it says it like this. Intelligent people think before they speak. I mean, in other words, you put your mind in gear before you put your mouth in motion, right? Intelligent people think before they speak, then what they say is more what? What's that word? Persuasive. If we're having critical conversations with people, we're trying to persuade them to the right course of action, aren't we? We need to prepare, we need to pray, we need to plan. And how persuasive do you think I could be preaching if I never prepared all week long? If I came up here and just said, you know, Disney Plus just put out Obi-Wan, that Star Wars Jedi guy series, and, and I binge watched it this week. I didn't have time to prepare a message. How persuasive do you think I could be if I didn't prepare anything? Probably not very much. If I hadn't prayed about it, planned for it. Now, can the Holy Spirit bail us out sometimes? Yes. But I seem to remember a passage where Jesus is talking to Satan, something along the lines of, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. I don't know. So being slow to speak means we're, we're thinking, we're preparing, we're praying, we're planning. Colossians 4, 6. Everything you say. Everything. Everything. You're going to underline it, highlight it, put an exclamation point by it. Everything you say. You know what's inclu not included in that? Not nothing, not know-how, right? There is nothing that's not included in that. Everything we say. Everything. Should be two things. It should be kind. It should be well thought out. We need to plan for the time, the place, that right location. We need to prepare in prayer. Plan what we're going to say. Then everything, it should be kind. Not just well thought out. It should be affirming. It should be affirming. When we speak, we should only affirm positive actions and positive behaviors. We, we shouldn't sweep the sin under the rug by any means. We bring that out, but we affirm the positive actions and positive behaviors. And, and, and you know what I, I know, and I've seen it happen before? <sighs> Preachers can be really good. We can be really good at listing sin. And we can focus on that over and over again. And it's pretty easy to do. Because last time I checked, everybody in here struggles with sin. <laughs> I've seen preachers preach on sin so well and so often they preached a lot of people right out of their church. See, they needed to understand when to speak, how to speak. We all do. Look at what Paul said in Ephesians 4.29. Speak. There's, there's an important word, only. What is helpful for building others up according to their needs so that they, that it may benefit those who listen. Speak only what is helpful. Only what builds up. 
understanding what they need, it takes a whole lot of listening to get to that point. It takes a whole lot of trust before they even care what you have to say. That, that saying, people don't, don't care what you know till they know you care. You need to meet them where they are and build them up. We're all sinners in need of a Savior, and we don't sweep the sin under the rug. But we need to build one another up with positive, affirming behavior and action. Not beat each other over the head with how not to behave, but how we should, how we ought, how we can follow Christ. Now, here's what the Bible says in Proverbs 15, too. When wise people speak, they make knowledge attractive. When you have listened, and you are quick to listen, and you are slow to speak, you're becoming more and more wise. And you are making your words more attractive. They're more persuasive. And last time, last time I knew, if we're having those critical conversations, we're trying to persuade someone to the way they should go, aren't we? To a better path, a different behavior, maybe even pointing them to Christ. Because ultimately, that's what our speech should be, pointing them to a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why the author of Hebrews in 619 say we as Christians have this hope as an anchor for the soul firm and secure when we speak in our conversation we need to offer hope we need to offer hope and when we do people will listen people will listen so go back to James Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. You see how if we do the first two well, the third one just naturally follows? I want to give you a little bit of homework. Two things. One, as, as I've been talking, you've probably been thinking about those places where you need a little bit more work. I want you to think about it. I want you to pray about it. I want you to work on that this week. Because last I checked, none of us are perfect and all of us can get better at communication. So think about one of those places where you can do better and focus on that. Pray about it this week. And number two, the second thing is this. Identify a person in your life that you need to have a critical conversation with. And start thinking how you should speak. Praying for the right time, the right place praying for the words that you need to have. Praying that it would be words of affirmation, words that provide hope, words that provide that same type of hope that, that you need, that we need. This is a hard one, isn't it? Be quick to listen. Slow to speak. That's how we handle critical conversations. Let's pray. God, we are so very thankful that even when we are slow to listen, but even when we are quick to speak, that you can still redeem those conversations that you can use those in our life as lessons to help us grow. God, we come to you like that woman that was caught in sin and adultery. Lord, we, we stand before you, sinners in need of a Savior, knowing that you say to each of us, whatever we're struggling with, you're saying, go sin no more. You're lifting us up showing us and 
sharing with us that hope that only you can give. Father, as, as we are slow to speak, may we truly provide the same hope we have in you to those who speak to us. God, we ask this in Jesus' precious name. So before we, we do our closing song here, I want to call an audible, I guess. <laughs> Real short one. Uh, so, so what was the verse that Pastor Joe had you memorize? Jesus wept, right? Shortest verse. Um, so years ago, I was, I was trying to memorize parts of scripture, and I came, I, this song, My Dear Brothers, uh, turned into a song so that I could memorize it. So it sounded a little bit like this. My dear brothers, take note of this. There was no sisters because it was an older version of NIV, but <laughs> brothers and sisters. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. I'll stop, but no, don't, don't clap. <laughs> you can clap when, I, when we release the single, yeah. <laughs> so anyhow, the uh, great verse, and uh, just felt like I ought to share that little song that we did. Please stand. runs deep your grace is more where grace is found it's where you are and where you are Lord I am free holiness is Christ
me pray before we go. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so very thankful that you are our one defense. You're our righteousness. God, may we be your people that are quick to listen and slow to speak. May we be righteous in Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. God bless. Have a great week. Lord, I need